This meeting is being recorded. You don't say. <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> uh today is may 24th this is the sets meeting this is a special one we have uh been planning to meet up with santiago diaz of google to discuss the proposal for prototype pollution which has a high overlap with what we're working on with lockdown and uh santiago please take it away thanks chris so i feel i i should sort of open up by saying that I am not a TC39 delegate. Um, I have experience working on web standards, uh, in particular with trusted types and CSV. Um, at Google, we do a lot of work to prevent XSS. Um, and that's how we get to prototype pollution in the first place, because you know, in the web platform, uh, prototype pollution is a big source of XSS. But I am still sort of finding my bearings in the way that TC39 works overall. And I have one observation in particular that I want to share with all of you, and is that I feel like um, while there are a lot of delegates that um, you know have opinions and, of course, experience in dealing with proposals, uh, I have felt like not very many delegates actually interact with the proposal itself, right? In terms of having a conversation like we're having right now, or opening issues on the GitHub repository, and so on and so forth. I'm a little bit afraid that there isn't enough of a feedback loop to make significant progress on the proposal. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today to sort of get your perception on, on you know, and compare it with ours and try to figure out exactly, you know, where we are on the same page and where our interests um, overlap, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll say that much. And, you know, hopefully if you see that at any point I am, uh, you know, there is some information that you can give me about how TC39 works or some of the other efforts that align with what we're proposing, I think that would be super useful feedback for me to kind of bring that to Google and iterate on the proposal, right? Um, okay, so here is a list of high level points that I extracted from the conversation that you had previously. I think there was a little bit of discussion about what is the thread mo model exactly for this proposal. Um, this is a bit of a gray area, and I'm going to try to share with you where we're coming from and what is the threat model that we think is, you know, worth addressing because it would make a significant security improvement on JavaScript overall. Fixing prototype pollution can be done at a few different sort of levels on the stack. So we considered things like the document policy, which is another spec, trusted types, uh, doing an extension to JavaScript. And I think they all have pros and cons, but we really decided to, you know, try our best with uh, doing a, you know, proposing a direct change to JavaScript because that seems like the best place where we can fix this, this class of issues. Um, another topic that you didn't talk about, but I think is really relevant to your conversation is basically what I call deployable security, which is this idea of proposing or sort of glancing at what an ideal solution to prototype pollution might be. And that way compare this idea that if we fix the override mistake, we fix prototype pollution as well. Um, maybe uh, when we compare that idea with the ideal solution, we might be able to measure exactly how much of the ideal solution we can achieve by fixing the override mistake. Um, of course, there is the topic of secure mode and what does secure mode work, uh, you know, mean and what it means in the context of this proposal in particular. Um, and then the last one is basically a few alternatives. And this is mostly an update of what's been going on in our conversations with other TC39 delegates on whether this particular proposal seems doable, seems, you know, where the, its complexities come from and so on and so forth. So, there are a couple of alternative options that I think would be worth discussing, and maybe some of them have to do with, uh, you know, have a good overlap with the conversations that SES folks have been having in the past. So this is a, a high level overview. I only have a handful of slides, uh, so I guess it would be good for us to just, you know, jump in at any point or, yeah, uh, however everybody else prefers, I suppose. Um, so let's talk a little bit about thread modeling first. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this um, this statement at the top, as which is like an object that uses uh, computer properties, it nests two pairs of brackets, and then it assigns a value, right? This is the minimal code sample that you need to introduce a prototype pollution vulnerability. 
The idea here is that key one and key two are controlled by the attacker. So if key one is under proto, an object inherits from the object prototype, then now you're standing on the object prototype and you can make changes to it, right? Add new properties or override existing properties. So this is really important because you're not really using any APIs. You're not making any special changes to the runtime. This is just pure naked JavaScript. And you know it seems like a very, uh, let's say, raw example to yield such a powerful exploit, right? Or such a powerful vulnerability. So um, let's try to define what a pollution vulnerability looks like. And that way, you know, exclude what other odd behaviors of JavaScript might exist, but not fall into the prototype pollution description. Um, the first thing that I want to note is that this is really not something that browsers can fix. It's not really a browser implementation bug. It's not something that you know Node.js can change. I think Node.js has some uh, you know protections against this, but well, we can talk about that later. But they are not really uh, they don't protect against the full spectrum of prototype pollution. Here is a particular example that is a vulnerability that got reported to Google against the Sanitizer API. You might have heard about this. It's something that browsers are working on at the moment. Basically, this person says that if an application is vulnerable to prototype pollution, we can use pollution to add elements to the allow list of the sanitizer, which determines what elements will and will not be sanitized. And then if we control that allow list, we can just call the sanitizer API and that way bypass it entirely, right? So this is a security bug as perceived by some external researcher. And the verdict for this bug was won't fix. And this is intended behavior, right? And this is arguably correct because the sanitizer API is really not doing anything wrong. There's only so much that it can do to stop this. And really what's going on here is you have a tainted runtime, um, the Kind of underlying assumptions that the sanitizer API logic has have been broken, and therefore there is a bug, right? But who who's at fault here? Well, it's not really the browser, it's not really the sanitizer API, and I hope that this exemplifies a little bit, you know, why we think there is really not much that browsers we can do that browsers can do to to fix this, right? The second one is that we're assuming a scenario where. Um, the attacker has no arbitrary JavaScript ex execution. If there is arbitrary code execution, uh, that's more or less game over in this threat model, right? Here we're talking about a data-only attack where there are no, there's no inclusion of external scripts, there is no calls to eval, uh, that kind of more traditional security vulnerabilities. Here we're talking about a completely locked down environment where uh, using only data, we can create these weird machines, turn the application logic against itself, and reach code execution. Right? Um, I think this is an important, an important point because we will see a couple of examples of bugs that people tend to call prototype pollution, but in this proposal and in the threat model that we're building, those are you know would would not be considered under that category. One of these examples, uh, you know, these two lines are used in some public blog posts to explain prototype pollution, where you basically uh, tame the object prototype to include a body with some arbitrary value, and then you call fetch, and that fetch makes a post post uh, request, but that post actually has a body, right? So this is a way in which people say prototype pollution can exfiltrate data. And so on and so forth, but this really doesn't fall under the prototype pollution description, simply because it's not a data-only attack. You already have JavaScript execution by the point you you know managed to do this, and um, if you had arbitrary code execution, you wouldn't need the fetch call in the first place, um, because you could you know chain together uh, references to other APIs and exfiltrate data in. A million other ways. So you really fetch is really a distraction in terms of what tainting the runtime is doing here for you. Can I can um, I, I just I'm sorry, just um, the I think I think that you know for for this session we should go ahead and adopt your terminology because you know you've prepared a presentation with this terminology. But I just I want to to just note that I object to this terminology. Uh, because the term prototype pollution attack has been used uh, for um, uh, you know for attacks like this, where it it did come from code, 
data only attack is a very, very clear uh, category. Uh, and I think what, and, and what I would describe as the distinction that you're making here is a data only prototype pollution attack. I would, I would not restrict the term prototype pollution to data only, I would just explicitly qualify. So I, I think um, our perspective has been that the prototype pollution is a subset of data only attacks, which do include other techniques. Um, okay, okay. Per, but, but just the, the reason I'm logging the complaint is that prototype pollution has been used historically without the data only uh, restriction. So, you know, I think that, that the category of attack you're defining is uh, certainly uh, a very important category, but, um, and, and I'm happy to use your terminology for this session, but I just want to log that redefining already established terminology to mean something narrower uh, is, is, um, is a problem. Mark, could you clarify uh, exactly what you mean by prototype pollution is uh, not data only? Because in my experience, um the triggering prototype pollution okay I, I think i see what you mean you're you're saying that it's possible to trigger prototype pollution either by having uh code execution or by uh using existing code that processes data and uh but they have the same effect in polluting the prototypes is that, is that that's what you mean right yeah, I mean, just very, very concretely, uh, freezing the prototypes. One of the ways in which we've, uh, you know, we've historically described that going going back to when we introduced object freeze in ECMAScript five, um, is talking about preventing prototype pollution attacks, where we're including code attacks and what we're preventing by freezing the prototypes. Right. So using a library, for example, as uh, Chris mentions, that uh, would modify prototype to uh, affect the behavior of uh, other code uh, that that library includes. Yeah, I mean it, the the um, yeah, I mean a lot the the early papers. I mean just the the um, uh, we often use the term prototype pollution to explain one of the attacks that we're preventing by using freeze. And we're certainly including code attacks uh, in the threat model when we're talking about preventing prototype pollution. So in any case, I think that we have general, uh, gen generally, um, we would like, uh, we, we register that we would like to qualify this as a data only prototype pollution attack, as opposed to other kinds of prototype pollution, as, a, as opposed to other kinds of data only, um, of which there are many other examples. And um, yeah. Uh, but let's let's pray continue. We will assume for the for the for the purposes of the presentation that prototype pollution means data only prototype pollution for your presentation. Okay, that 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 I think that's the first takeaway that I take that I you know uh, yeah that I take with me because um, once you have code execution, it feels like prototype pollution in that sense is used as an exploitation technique and not as a vulnerability itself, right? Um, the, the prototype pollution I'm talking about here is one that leads to code execution. So once you already have code execution, it seems like you have bigger problems than that of like prototypes being immutable or you being able to build weird machines by modifying prototypes. So, uh, so, uh -huh. I mean, that's, that's sort of the whole point of what the CES group has been about and going back to uh, the uh, e effort in ES5 to support object capabilities in JavaScript and the, the, the uh, Google Kahai effort, et cetera, um, uh, and the work that Bonneville is doing. Um, all of this is um, to enable mutually suspicious code uh, to coexist and interact uh, where uh, executing code that you don't trust within the hardened JavaScript environment is not considered an attack any more than executing, than, you know, than, than the browser would consider executing 
code that the browser doesn't trust in an iframe to be an attack. We're trying to enable mutually suspicious code to coexist so, so, in the same context. I see. So th Mark, that, Mark, that is a, a useful clarification because I think um, you're talking about a, a situation where you have hostile code, right? Untrusted code that is running in an environment and you want to sort of sandbox it, right? Um, and that is a fundamental difference between that and the threat model that I'm exposing now, where you have benign yes. code that you trust and that can be manipulated using data. And of course, that, that will lead to slightly different solutions, right? Yes, yeah. yes. These are very, very different threat models. I agree 100%. Um, right. uh, the, po the point is that the term prototype pollution is used in discussions under both threat models. I see. Okay, um, so maybe we can, I, I agree, maybe we can move on you know, using this terminology. I don't think we need to stick to it. So if at any point you have any comments about, uh, you know, that wouldn't fit this threat model, but that would include the sort of untrusted code uh, bits, I think that would be useful to, to, you know, to talk about as well. So, you know, I think we can be flexible and play by ear, I suppose. The next thing, um, you know, under the data only prototype pollution attack that is important about prototype pollution is this uh, concept of spooky action at a distance, right? Which is the idea that there is a single receiver in the statement that we have at the top of this slide, but that receiver can mm, has a very wide blast impact radius, right? Because it can affect so many other objects at runtime. And to some extent, um, the impact of a prototype pollution exploit is a direct function of how many objects you can affect, you can taint with it, right? And I think this is a really important point because in many of the discussions we've, having a, we've been having about this, we sort of tend to conflate the concept of polluting the runtime by making changes to the built-in prototypes, like the array prototype or object or you know, strings and whatnot, and the kind of prototype pollution that you get by tainting application-defined prototypes, right? These are, you know, uh, entirely two different class of, of vulnerabilities in the sense that one gives you a lot more versatility and a lot more, you know, uh, exploit primitives than the other, right? And some of the solutions that we're going to discuss uh, they are geared towards protecting the built-in prototypes and some others will be geared towards protecting the entire prototype chain, right? And I think this is something that we tend to conflate in our conversations. So by talking about spooky action at a distance, I am trying to generalize this idea that we really need to protect the entire chain to stop the, the class of bugs from happening. It may be that the solutions that we have for that are not super practical, and we might have to buy the bullet and protect only built-in prototypes, but that should be a decision that we're conscious about and that we make, uh, let's say, willfully, right? Um, yes. And then the last, uh, the last idea that I want to put forward is this, this concept of the surprise factor, right? Um, of course, developers rely on mutable prototypes and they're expecting prototypes to be there to do their job, but it seems unreasonable for a developer to expect that this statement that we're looking at can taint the runtime, right? And this really hints at one of the fundamental symmetries of JavaScript, which is the symmetry between the dot notation and the bracket notation. It seems that uh, the cracks of that symmetry are starting to show in the sense that if I say object.prototype and then you know, make a change to it, I am expressing intent as a developer. I really want to access the prototype in this line of code. Whereas if I write the statement that we have on the screen, it, it doesn't, that, that intent is not there, right? With the exception of some very specialized code that maybe does reflection or deals with dynamic objects. I think uh, we hopefully can uh, agree that the vast majority of code bases out there will not have this, this kind of code. And so, you know, I guess we're trying to solve for the vast majority. I think Matthew has a, a hand raised. Yeah, could you clarify what you mean by that, that developers rely on mutable prototypes? Uh, in which circumstance do you see a developer uh, relying on having a mutable prototype? Yeah, I think uh, maybe mutable is, is a little misleading here, but the idea that the chain, the chain of prototypes is mutable, 
and that you can that the prototypes are there for you to add uh, properties that are going to be inherited, and you might choose uh, at different points in the runtime lifecycle when to add those properties is something that developers rely on, right? It's it's sort of the expected behavior of the prototype chain. I, yeah, but do you expect uh, the prototype to stay mutable after, for example, a class has been defined? Uh, so, or, for example, uh, do you expect the built-in prototypes to stay mutable after polyfills have, to, have been installed? So this is a super important question and one that I hope we can, we can talk more about because I think developers um, expect that they will stay mutable but it seems like the vast majority of code bases don't actually make use of that fact, right? So to them, it seems irrelevant whether it stays mutable or not. And it feels like that is something that we can exploit to fix these class of vulnerabilities. Now, there are a number of exceptions to that rule. And those exceptions are fairly important. And I think you know they will determine whether we make that compromise or not. One example that I have is we've seen a lot of uh, developer tools uh, that do, for example, hot swapping. So you make a change to your JavaScript code and that change is automatically hot swapped on your browser so you can see you know, the effects of your change, right? A lot of those hot swapping tools uh, really rely on the prototypes being mutable throughout the lifetime of your browser tab, right? And making sort of restricting those environments is going to break those tools, right? So this is the kind of trade-offs that we're presented with where we might say, well, you know, you have to disable your protections if you're going to be in developer mode. Um, and we accept that fact because for the remaining 90% of use cases, we're actually protecting the vast majority. Um, yes, so this is this is one of those trade-offs. So for, to clarify that example, um, hot swapping implementations like that, is do you see that as mostly a uh, development time uh, uh, feature that's needed, or do you see that as also being used in production in some cases? So we've tried to do research on this uh, because I really want to get data to answer these questions rather than going with my gut feeling. Unfortunately, this is a really difficult one to find to to you know to answer. As far as we can tell, this is used mostly in a development environment where you don't really go in production with it. There have been some really niche cases, as I said before, of applications that do uh, very specialized reflection or you know things like that. They seem like edge cases, and I think the answer that I would give to the question today is, you know, they are in the realm of development and not in production. But with that big caveat, right? That you know, it's, that is is based on on what we can see and what we can the static analysis that we can do at scale. And there are a bunch of unknown unknowns that you know might change the real answer to that question, right? Yeah. yeah. Let me so, let, let me just want to want to contribute a little bit of uh, empirical data about uh, one of the questions we just talked about, uh, which is uh, we've now run a rather substantial amount of code loaded as a rather substantial number of packages uh, into hardened JavaScript that were not written to run under hardened JavaScript. Uh, and the we've um, I'm actually not aware uh, I mean we so we know that shims mod, you know shims polyfills modify prototypes uh, for things that are designed to run after uh, shims have have done their work. Uh, we've I don't know that we've encountered any failures uh, that were due to attempts by normal code to modify built-in prototypes. Um, uh, what we have encountered a lot of are failures due to the override mistake um, uh, when we. Um, uh, so, um, so if we haven't counted any failures by mod by modifying uh, built-in prototypes, it's certainly been very rare compared to failures with the override mistake. And even with failures with the override mistake, what we find is that the vast majority of code that we've tried, a tremendous amount of code that we've tried, um, does work under that under hardened JavaScript, despite the fact that it was not written to run under hardened JavaScript. 
So Mark, let me ask you a question. Um, so I, a lot of our observations match with what you just described, um, but it's what we've noticed is that there's a spectrum. If we freeze only the object prototype, we find almost no breakages whatsoever because not a lot of code seems to rely on the object prototype on like, you know, adding sort of global state, I'm gonna call it on the global prototype for everybody to access. But the more we add, the more prototypes we add to that list of frozen, uh, you know, uh, prototypes. So once we get into the more, you know, weird uh, edge cases of like the regular expressions prototype, the error prototype, and even in some cases, the array prototype, basically the more we add to it, the more we see failures. So I think it would be interesting are, to know. Are, are, you, are you distinguishing modifications versus the override mistake? Yes, yes I am. So to give you an example, uh, there are some tools that will change, that will add functions to the array prototype so that you can call those functions and they can, you know, they will stringify your array in some special way, right? So if we freeze only the object prototype, uh, we don't see any failures on that application, but if we do the object prototype and the array prototype, that application will fail. And so the more prototypes you freeze, the more likely you are, it seems, to find a failure. And that is uh, distinct from the override mistake, right? So I think it would be interesting to know how many prototypes and what prototypes you've frozen in, in Harden.js and try to correlate our observation with yours. Okay. Um, good. So, so uh, good. This will be a good, good exploration. I'm very interested to, to see your data on, on the failures of that form that you've encountered and how common they are. Okay, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely, you know, add this to my notes and maybe we can have a follow up uh, conversation about that. Yeah. So, um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the override mistake. I think that's a, that's a really good segue. And, um, you know, what, what we mean by deployable security. I think there might be a, a few gaps here between uh, the language design that you folks do at Harden.js and, and TC39 and the kind of security features that we have designed with uh, browser vendors outside of JavaScript. So I think it would be interesting to see exactly what that gap is. This is our idea of an ideal solution. Um, the first thing that I want to call out here is that it should be opinionated. Um, we think that it is very likely that freeze or other such APIs might not see huge numbers in terms of adoption because they really require uh, the developer to know, to be an expert in the problem space, right? What prototypes should I freeze? When should I freeze them? Uh, what's the difference between sealing and freezing and preventing ex um, extensions? All of those are questions that put off developers from using uh, these APIs. And even when you try to think about um, the problem of, okay, let's say that a developer really understands freeze and that the override mistake doesn't exist. Um, they want to protect as much as they can. So they really have to go for all the built-in prototypes. And now they have to gather a list of application defined prototypes and they have to call freeze on each one of them. That is a significant amount of work that they need to do to make this happen. And this needs to happen for every application, right? Wouldn't it be great if we had some kind of API that says, you know, uh, freeze all important prototypes, right? And that would do it for you. I think that really lowers the bar for adoption and is something that current solutions are, are, are really missing beyond the override mistake. Um, there are a couple of other of these. I, I think I, maybe it's not worth going in detail about all of them, but basically we're trying to aim for a solution that you can just deploy with minimal or no changes. And I think there are some advances in that direction, some progress in that direction, but we're not really quite there yet. Um, at the moment, I think, you know, let's talk about effectiveness in a, in a, in a second, is, is part of what we were talking about before, right? Like depending on your threat model, you will, think that a solution is more or less effective, right? So maybe the solution that we're proposing here, which is only for data only prototype pollution attacks will work in that bubble, but maybe not in the case where you have untrusted JavaScript, right? And then finally, there's, there is some weirdness currently with uh, sloppy mode and strict mode in the sense that if you freeze things in sloppy mode, you really won't realize that your assignments didn't take place because there are silent errors and that has been very bad for developer experiences. 
and for you know to see these APIs being adopted more widely. At Google, uh, certainly we have decided not to go with some of these options because uh, you know the the vulnerability experience is is really not great when you are not in in strict mode. So I would like to use those uh, attributes that I just talked about and sort of um, you know over uh, overlap them with what freezing looks like nowadays. So I just talked about freezing not being uh, opinionated and that being a, a blocker for adoption. I guess we can we can go beyond that. Currently, the overriding mistake is, of course, probably the most important uh, issue that freezing has. Apart from a few different issues, I think we have already touched on a couple of them. The one that I want to highlight here is freezing points uh, and the idea that freezing points are unreliable. I think it is fair to say, and it might be white, like non-controversial, if I said that most well-behaved applications maybe modify some of the prototypes because they have these runtimes and these shims and they never modify them again. And so you can say that there is this freezing point after which um, it really doesn't matter if the, if the prototype chain is completely immutable, right? Unfortunately, that is not the case for all applications out there. And there is a very good argument to be made and is that if you have a freezing point today uh, that you found and that is reliable to you, the inclusion of a third party library or of a new shim might move that freezing point up or down in terms of the life cycle of the runtime. And so we've seen applications that have broken in, you know, two, three months after implementing this because the freezing point moved and so, you know, Combine that with the debugging experience of sloppy mode and strict mode and the override mistake, it really doesn't make freezing that appealing to a developer who just wants to focus on writing their code without worrying about all this weirdness with, with prototype pollution. And then finally, uh, freezing is only effective for a subset of problems that prototype pollution uh, enables, right? And this is a point where I would really like to hear your opinions on, um, basically. Most of the times when we refer to prototype pollution, we refer to a bug that allows us to add a property to um, another object, or maybe hijack uh, an existing property. But we don't often talk about what I call here read-only attacks, which is basically cases where you have a secret in some object, and you can use these data-only attacks to get a reference to that object and to that secret and read them, right? You don't actually make any changes to the runtime. You don't taint the runtime, but you use the, uh, the, the surprise factor of bracket notation to get a reference to other objects and read their secrets. So that is a very uh, rare type of attack. We've seen maybe a couple of examples of this in the wild. Um, I don't know if those attacks are worth uh, let's say, are a deal breaker in terms of the solutions that we're discussing, but it's important to, to bear them in mind. And there's there has been one case only of this attack that we're calling function swapping, which is quite interesting, actually. They use bracket notation and these sort of gadgets that lead to prototype pollution to take the includes on arrays and assign it to the includes on strings, right? So that means that the logic for includes changes and you can sort of turn the application logic onto itself by using that trick, right? So you're not actually tainting anything. You're not adding any new properties or changing existing ones. You're just sort of swapping functions around and, and you know, uh, taking some advantage from that. Again, this is extremely rare. It, like the stars need to be aligned. I, I don't think this is a, a deal breaker, but I thought this was probably a, a, a good couple of examples of the types of attack that will be left behind when, you know, if we decide to improve freezing or have a super frozen mode or, or something like that. So, so, so I did not understand, um, I actually didn't understand both of those. Uh, if all of the built-in primordials are frozen and um, uh, in a data only system, how do you engage? I mean, the, the function swapping attack you just explained changes string dot prototype. No, it does. Yes, it does. So, so, uh, so I think so, they, so, so frozen runtime could that couldn't happen in a frozen runtime. So, correct. 
so the function swapping cannot happen in a frozen runtime. Uh, it can happen now if we freeze, for example, the object prototype, but we don't freeze the array or the string prototypes, right? Okay. Is this idea that uh, freezing is done on a prototype by prototype basis, and that the developer needs to know what prototypes are worth freezing and how to freeze them and when to freeze them. So in the status quo, it is very likely that many applications, as we've seen them, freeze the object prototype, but don't freeze anything else. And these attacks still happen, even on applications that consider themselves hardened by having frozen their object prototype. Okay. So okay. with we so so okay so so I so I so I understand good good we we understand each other on the function swapping, on the read only attacks, if all of the built in uh, uh, primordials all of the built in intrinsics, are frozen, uh, does the is the read only attack still possible? Um, and if so, I'd love to see an example. I think it it will still be possible because with bracket notation, if you can walk up the object hierarchy um, you know, far, far enough, you will eventually be able to reach a prototype that might have a secret, right? How, that does, prototype, the prototype, how, how, do, how does the prototype come to have a secret if the prototype was frozen? Um, yes, if it's frozen, you, uh, you know, what we're saying here is if the prototype is frozen from the get-go, then there is no a moment in time where the developer has a chance to put a secret on that prototype. But we go back again to the argument that in order for that to happen, the developer really needs to know what prototypes to freeze in the first place, right? Okay. Okay. As long as you leave this responsibility to the, the, to the developer where they might freeze the object prototype, but not anything else, you have this possibility open, which is that secrets are gonna be put in prototypes that are not the object prototype. Right. Okay, good. So, so I understand both of these. Thank you. Excellent. So I think perhaps the most important part about freezing objects in 2023 is that the override mistake is actually a bypass to freeze, right? There are situations that we've seen in the wild where, as I said before, an application froze some of its prototypes and, um, you know, the, the, uh, attacks were still possible due to the overall mistake. And you all know about this. So, you know, I think this is highly not controversial. Right, I'm sorry, I, I, I did not did, did not understand how the over the override mistake deters people freezing things, but given the things are frozen, the override mistake, uh, uh, you know, causes a loss of progress, causes things to fail that should have, have proceeded, causes things to fail with a thrown exception but doesn't otherwise enable attacks. So you talk about the, the attack being to induce a thrown exception to prevent progress? No, no, this is, this is exactly, um, it might have been good to, to add an example here, but there are certain constructs that will allow you to set properties on frozen prototypes, even if, yeah, even if they're frozen. So this is, is, is a strong statement about, uh, you know, being able to bypass those checks, right? Um, I, okay, I, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to understand that because it, if an object is frozen, you cannot set a property on it or modify it. So I- Or I, read that by the <laughs> Sorry, what did you say, Chris? You can't reconfigure the object either. There's the, I, I do not understand the claim that a frozen object can- yeah. I, it's difficult to explain it without uh, an example, but are you, the are you trying to make the? Are you trying to? Is this an extension of the argument that uh, that leaving it up to the to the application developer to decide when to freeze uh, allows? Oh, no. no, no, not quite. Um, there is a specific code construct that you can uh, use, where, for example, you have a parent class, um, and then a child that extends from it you freeze the parent, the parent has some uh, property set on it that has been frozen. Um, and now in the child class, you get two distinct behaviors. If you try to set that property in the constructor, or if you try to, or if you set the property to null outside of the constructor and then set a value on the constructor. That is a specific case that we've seen where if you do the second thing that I described, which is setting it to null, outside of the constructor and then setting it in the constructor, 
that will not throw and the assignment will actually happen. So this is seems like a bypass to the freeze, you know, uh, primitive. Um, does, I, I would love to see this example. Uh, I do not understand it from the description. Um, uh, it's 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 uh, the object invariants which are in the ECMAScript spec. I think are very clear about the guarantees that should follow from an object being frozen. So if what you're talking about is possible in a given implementation, it sounds like, with, I mean, without understanding in detail what you're talking about, it's, it sounds like that implementation might be in violation of the spec. I see. This is uh, super important. This is really, I, I'm glad that we talked about this because I thought this was common knowledge um, I will definitely prepare an example, maybe add it to the notes after after this uh, meeting is over, and you know maybe we can follow up on that. There might be uh, uh, a, an implementation bug, or maybe this is a you know the, the bypass is not as as complete as I'm describing it here. Uh, so I think it's, it's definitely a point that we need to clarify. Is it possible that this is about? Um, is, is does this attack presume that? freeze is called on the instance at a point in its constructor and that subclasses are able to, uh, that subclasses are in a position to decide when to call their super constructor, or is this possibly an issue with return override where a function constructor can return a different object than the one that it received as its uh, oh, receiver? I, I doubt it. I will double check it, but I doubt it. The code construct that I have in mind uh, is a completely, let's say, benign, run-of-the-mill creation of a child class um, that simply sets a property on the constructor, and it doesn't do anything uh, special uh -huh. beyond that. Okay, so so one thing that is likely to occur from this investigation, I am also interested in seeing that exact example, but it sounds to me like it's a not a prototype pollution, but an instance pollution that, uh, that it's possible because of subclassing. Does that sound like a good characterization? Uh yeah, okay. I think that might be, yeah, that might be correct. Um, and that gives us an opportunity for an instance to carry um, uh, to, uh, an instance to carry the uh, private uh, what should be private data and expose it to a, someone who holds an instance of that object. Okay. it it still seems that so the the the, the highlighted line on the slide um, uh, that the override mistake, itself is the bypass still seems very unlikely to me. The override mistake is only causing something that should have succeeded at, at modifying to instead throw. So it can't enable modifications that would not have otherwise been enabled. Okay, let's, let's follow up on this because um, the example we have I'm gonna dig the exact example and, and reproduce it and share the code snippet with you because it seems to imply that you um, that you can call some assignment on a frozen prototype. Yeah. Um, yes, maybe something that we can, uh, it, it is also related to fixing the operating mistake. So I guess, you know, if uh, regardless of whether the bypass is full or maybe I, I can imagine that it could be a situation where you the assignment actually doesn't throw, but it is also not effective. I don't remember it off the top of my head right now, um, but we, we can follow up. Okay, I'm also going to make a bizarre request, which is if there is an implementation in which such modification to frozen objects is possible by whatever means, uh, this might mean that some of the current users of hardened JavaScript are vulnerable. So I'm going to make a request that the, the recording of this meeting be held back and that the um, uh, further pursuit of this be treated as a responsible disclosure matter. That seems reasonable to me. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Um, I have a general observation regarding freezing objects. I, I think in general, on our side, when we talk about um, freezing the intrinsics, we're, 
we wouldn't we would not ever like recommend just freezing object dot prototype but uh, freezing uh, every intrinsic that exists uh, in the environment or let's, um, in yeah. Let, let's let's uh, let's run to the end because there's yeah. a possibility that there's a very strong possibility that the attacks that Santiago is seeking to prevent um, are in a in a, a in a different category than the ones that we're that that fit within the object capability model. Um, and we're low on time for slides, so uh, and I'm eager to see us run to the end of the presentation. If it, we have to continue at next time, that would be <clears throat> that would be fine by us. But also, um, e again, eager to get to the end. <clears throat> let's um, let's pause questions till until the end of the presentation. Yes, I think in particular talking about um, a sort of secure mode, I think is is of interest to to everybody here, right? Um, Okay, so let's uh, skip ahead and talk about, you know, modes and flags. So the original proposal um, and the way that it was explained in TC39 discusses this concept of a secure mode, right? And this has been the source of, of much confusion. Um, there is a note on the proposal that talks about how the, word, the words secure mode are really misleading. First, because it's not entirely, like it's not clear secure against what? Um, and here we're talking about secure against prototype pollution. So that is a question of, let's say, semantics. But second, there seems to have been a collision between mode in the sense of sloppy mode or strict mode and simply feature, right? Which is a feature of like, let's call it a super frozen feature. Naming is hard and, and, and you know, we call it mode. And I think one of the things that you've discussed is that there are other problems that are discussed in maybe TC39, maybe uh, Harden JS, that could benefit from a secure mode, right? In the sense of strict mode. So for this proposal and for this class of attacks, our intention was not to introduce a new mode. I have been in close contact with the V8 team and talked about the complexities of different implementations. And since I, I um, you know, read the transcript for, for your previous conversations, I brought this to them. And I think the general consensus is that implementing a new mode is a, carries huge engineering cost and complexity, right? So it do, there doesn't seem to be appetite by, by browser vendors, as far as I can tell, to implement a new mode to fix data only prototype pollution attacks, right? There may be a different case to be made about different classes of problems that can be uh, solved by introducing a new mode. And maybe prototype pollution can benefit from that. But uh, when we compare the solutions that we have for this particular problem with the cost of implementing a new mode to solve that problem, that doesn't seem like a good trade-off. That is not a good balance in terms of you know, implementation cost. Instead of talking about a mode, uh, we should change the proposal. And I was going to do this today, but I wanted to talk to you all uh, before for the sake of transparency. What we really want to talk about is feature flags and how can you, when you introduce a, a backward, uh, a change that is not backward compatible, how do you introduce a knob that allows the developer to say, I want to opt into this, right? We looked into different ideas, a different, maybe using a directive, maybe using, you know, there's a few different ideas and they're written on the proposal. And I think we've landed on the idea that an out of band flag is the right way to do this. An HTTP header or a command line argument, depending on where you're executing, seems like the best way of doing it. So that is entirely different from a mode. And I hope that that can, you know, maybe we can help you make a case for a secure mode by using the problem space of prototype pollution. I think, you know, that, that would be wonderful. In terms of using of uh, pushing for a secure mode to solve prototype pollution, I don't think that's a big hammer to to solve a, a small problem. To to put it that way, and I really wanted to uh, be explicit about this because I think there's been some confusion there that um, you know we we have been proposing the the introduction of a secure mode. Um, yeah, I don't know if there are any comments about that, um, but beyond that. The last slide that I have, not this one, sorry about that. Uh, the last slide that I have is this, which is basically just a comparison of the proposals that we have at the moment and what's going on with them. This is basically a mini update of what's been going on since our conversation back in February or March to today. 
the top row is introducing new symbols, which is our original proposal. There's been some interesting conversations with Kevin on the GitHub repository about how the complexity of deleting the constructor property might be a deal breaker for this proposal. It would be good to have more opinions, but that's basically the, the main blocker at the moment. Um, I, of course, like this proposal because it protects against all pollution variants. It basically doesn't rely on freezing anything, but it just cuts all avenues that an object has to reach out to, to walk up the object hierarchy. And that is a slightly different uh, perspective than that of freezing or, you know. Um, I, I would put an asterisk on that though. That is assuming uh, the data handling doesn't have a way to express a, a known symbol as string, correct? Yes, you. that is a more accurate description. Yes, you're right. In fact, uh, the, uh, the reason why we introduce symbols is because, you know, 99.99% of bugs that we see in the wild have to do with the fact that user input comes in the form of strings, right? In order to, to get a hold of a symbol as an attacker using only data, data only attacks, you need to have some kind of code execution to begin with. And so symbols seem to be distinct from strings or at least raise the bar so high that you will have to combine multiple bugs in order to get an, a working exploit. So, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm raising this because, for example, we have a, uh, an encoding uh, uh, on, on our side that allows uh, expressing a well-known symbol, uh, that encodes a well-known symbol as a string. So if you parse that, all of a sudden you get back to the, sort of, to the case where uh, you can walk uh, prototypes and constructors uh, through uh, symbols. I see. That's a, that's a very good point. If, we could, if I could get any references to... I don't know if you're talking about a hypothetical future proposal or something that is actually happening. No, I mean it's an application and uh, it's an application level uh, encoding oh, uh, of data. So uh, it, it's just that we support encoding uh, well-known symbols as strings. Yes. The same, the so same way some applications like support referencing uh, functions as a string or things like that. Uh, we support well-known symbols. Yes, that's spot on. And there is a little bit of discussion about this concept of um, a symbol that is unutterable. So something that you cannot even refer in code. Uh, maybe instead of getting saying dot constructor or bracket notation symbol dot constructor, maybe you should definitely go through a function and say get constructor off, right? And then that I think would be closer to the original description that I gave which is cutting ties for an object to use bracket notation to reach out to the, to the, uh, to the object hierarchy. So this, is, uh, this proposal is on one end of the spectrum where we solve the, the largest amount of problems, but at the cost of complexity, right? There is a proposal that Kevin has that is sort of a, you know, a, a variant of this. And I think he's, he's talked about this in, in other contexts as well, which is to exotically reject new properties on set which is just a, a way to bypass the override mistake, right? It's, it's kind of implementing what the, uh, if we didn't have the override mistake, this is the world we would uh, live in. It, it has some of the same problems of freezing, uh, but it is decidedly a, a good option that we can use. It doesn't solve all the problems that the original proposal um, aims to solve, but it, it, is, it is something that we can definitely consider. And then finally, and I wanted to get some input from you on this, is this idea that why don't we just fix the override mistake, right? I got from your previous conversation uh, this idea, I don't know if I misinterpreted, that the study that was done a few years back, I believe, to measure um, how common the override mistake is might have misleading results because I believe there was some piece of code in Lodash that triggered some metrics and that inflated artificially the results of the experiment. I'm not entirely sure what's going on there, but I think there is no canonical answer to how common is the override mistake in the wild. From Mark's um, intervention before saying that running um, code in hardened JS, you've come across the override mistake several times. That makes me believe that it, the override mistake is indeed very common. Uh, and that's all. No, 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 no. The, 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 it's not that code, it's, 
it's that by freezing things that the code did not expect to be frozen, code fails because it hits the override mistake. That's completely different than the question, if you fixed the override mistake, what code would fail as a result of fixing the override mistake? It's sort of, it's even the opposite. It means that for the, for the code that I was talking about, if there was no override mistake, or if the override mistake were fixed, then those failures would not have happened. That code would have continued to work. I see. Yes, that's decidedly a different a, a different statement. Yeah. So I think um, maybe other TC39 delegates have information about this, but as far as I can tell, and from talking to a few you know different people, there is really no clear path at this point on whether the override mistake can be fixed, how it should be fixed, and whether that will be you know, break a large number of, of code bases or not. So I put this at the bottom because it seems like this might be sort of a problem, a, a solution to a subset of problems that doesn't actually solve prototype pollution as a whole. Um, but it's, it's the farthest in terms of, you know, us knowing an actionable item to say, what's next? How can we make progress about this? Um, yeah, and this is, sorry for taking so much time. This is the, the end of, of what I had for you today. I hope that I have touched on most of the topics that were relevant for, you know, the SES presentation. I certainly take uh, good notes for myself and to share with my team. Um, yeah, not sure if anybody has any other comments. Well, thank you for coming for one. I know we're over time and some of us have a following meeting to go to. Um, uh, are you open to having to continue in this conversation at a future meeting? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, let's uh, well, please reach out to me about your scheduling. We'll we'll put it on the calendar at the at the earliest CES meeting possible. Um, it sounds like there is a great deal of common ground, regardless of whether you go all the way on any particular approach. It sounds like. We want to come up with a solution that shares some common rails at the very least, because there are obviously graduated le levels of opt-in that might be necessary that an application author is going to have to make if they go all the way to the hardened JavaScript variant or at some of these rest stops along the way that solve a lot of real problems for code that can't eval. Um, so um, I'm eager I'm eager to continue this conversation. And, um, now. Excellent. Yeah, yes, let, me, I... let, me, let, me, let me toss in one possibility to, for, you, for you to think about, which is since you're talking about feature flags as um, uh, where the, for opting into a change in behavior, uh, even if there is some code out there that would break if you fix the override mistake, uh, the question I wanna leave you with is, what if there was an opt-in feature flag for fixing the override mistake? Uh -huh. So I think it will be interesting to hear why we need a feature flag for that. Um, it, it probably means that fixing the override mistake could not scale. It would not apply to you know, the, the majority of code bases. But I think if it comes to the realization that we cannot implement a proposal that fixes all of the variants of prototype pollution, and that we should only be fixing the most common variants, which are those where you attack the built-in prototypes or a subset of them, and the overhead mistake, fixing the overhead mistake achieves that, then I think that's a feature flag that we would want in the web platform and you know in Node.js and in, J in JavaScript runtimes overall, right? Um, so yes, I think I am in principle uh, supportive of this, uh, but I think it, it, it is interesting for us to exhaust the solutions that we have that go all the way in uh, do due diligence on them. And if we find out that they are definitely too complex or, you know, there is there is a blocker that we cannot get passed by, I think this this is a very reasonable idea to, to consider. Yeah, I think that we're on the same page, that if it is possible to solve the product, the, if it is possible to solve uh, the override mistake in general for everybody without a mode or a flag, then everybody here, I think, would be in favor of such a solution. If it isn't possible that there, if it is, it is necessary to opt in on an application to application basis, we're also in favor of that possibility, if necessary. Um, 
I, I would like to, with that comment, and you know, I don't want to hold you back anymore, but with that comment, I, I want to leave you all with uh, also sort of an open-ended question, and is whether uh, you would be in favor of creating some kind of construct that allows us to have a more opinionated way of freezing, one where we don't rely on the developer freezing the right things at the right time, uh, but we can we can say, look, this is a this is a package of prototypes that need to be frozen for you to have reasonable security. I think that should is, is something interesting that we can discuss in in the follow up. Isn't you, that essentially what we do? That is what we do. The, <laughs> that is what we do. We, I mean, our our solution is basically freeze it all. No, that's not our. Yeah, our you, you, fair point. Fair point. But, <laughs> uh, our position, our position at the moment. And of course, I want to make sure that we're open to having a broader conversation about what we can do going forward that might embrace other needs. Um, but what we do at the moment with the CES shim and in other CES-like environments, the hardened JavaScript, if you will, is that we transitively freeze. Um, so it, it, there, there are two parts to our solution, one of which is compartmentalization, which is to say that guest code runs inside of a compartment where it only has access to certain intrinsics. We call them the shared intrinsics. And the shared intrinsics are shared not just between compartments, but also with the, with the realm. And those are transitively frozen. So that's array, object, et cetera. Anything that we are willing to give a guest program is frozen. And anything else is open-ended. And it's up to the application author to advance the, to advance the line of what is frozen. It's also the responsibility of a library author to write, to harden their own libraries if the objects of, that are shared by that library are passed between mutually suspicious parties. That is to say, it isn't, it isn't a silver bullet. It's a concern that the application author has to carry with them. But there are also like gradiated, also within our model, there are graduated levels of concern that there's a lot that can be, a lot can be addressed by running third party dependencies, for example, um, inside of compartments on a package by package basis in order to mitigate prototype, prototype pollution that can be instigated from within the supply chain, which is not the general, which is not the threat model that you began the conversation with, to be clear. Of course, yes. It sounds like there might be some of those ideas that HardenJS already has that we can bring into this proposal so that normal JS uh, sort of can can inherit, right? And and that uh, you know this this particular point seems to be one of those. Yeah. yeah. And I would say in, in general, the paradigm is you install whatever shims there may be, and then you lock down, which does freeze all those intrinsics. It's not just of the prototype, it is uh, basically every uh, everything as uh, Chris mentioned that might be shared. Um, and after that, the best practice is to harden uh, everything. Uh, so that's what uh, Chip mentioned, where uh, if you define a new class uh, or you export a function, at the place where you define it or export it or whatever, uh, you, in, you've hardened it as well. Uh, and it, even for instances, uh, it, the best practice is to uh, harden instances as well, uh, because in general, we keep uh, states not as uh, properties of the instance itself, uh, but we would keep it well uh, in, anyway. So the only surface of the object are functions, uh, which, so all that all, all the instance itself can be uh, hardened as well. So the paradigm is always hardened everything. <laughs> yeah, also, yeah. hardening is just a a more straightforward API than having to go through the gymnastics of freezing, uh, because it does various you know recursive uh, uh, things. Um, and the other is we kind of fall into the mode where you sort of harden everything by default and then selectively make decisions about what things are not going to be hardened as opposed to the problem that you were talking about at the beginning, which is, you know, how does the developer decide which things to freeze? Um, you, you know, because obviously you could, you could just miss something, but um, since most of the time having something be uh, uh, f frozen or not, the code that interacts with it is indifferent to that. So um, having having the baseline be everything is hardened, and then and then making 
being more selective about what you ease up on. Turns out there's way fewer decisions you have to make uh, when you're working in that mode. Absolutely. I think, I think this, this matches very well the sort of the experience that we have with hardening applications at scale. I think we it, it's, it's entirely aligned. Start from everything strict and then relax rather than the other way around. Yeah. However, we, we do understand that uh, most existing application code probably cannot just harden instances like that. They, they will usually use properties to keep their uh, mutable uh, state, uh, for example, which they yeah. don't have. Well, in any case, there is a ladder and at the base of the, it would be nice to help people at the base of the ladder and as well as the people who by necessity have to go to the top of the ladder in order to run arbitrary guest code inside of their application, which is not what, not what everybody is doing. It's what the browser does. It's not what, <laughs> that's not what every application does, but there are a lot of platforms out there that benefit from it. So, um, and also, and also supply chain attacks are, are an increasingly, an increasingly large uh, concern. Yeah, on the note of supply chain attacks, there is, um, I think the, you know, there's places where we haven't been able to freeze the runtime because some third party library, you know, your code is well behaved, but the libraries that you use are not. And there's only so much control you have as a developer, right? Um, not everybody's gonna create a pull request on the on the library's GitHub page. So yes, those are all kind of blockers for the for, for adoption. Yeah. Oh, in any case, we're well over time and look forward to having a future conversation. Please reach out. And again, um, and that's it. I'm going to, and then that's the meeting. <laughs>